Um, basically, um, you've had um, a nice introduction from Lindell to um, how we're sampling Adiptra uh, and a very nice uh, talk from Mara talking about um, how the technical side of things works. So uh, this is just um, a summary from me um, of what this is really going to mean for the UK Diptera fauna. So uh, I've got a couple of slides talking about what uh, sequence information is available at the moment. So that's before the Darwin Tree of Life project. And then a couple of slides um, talking about challenges that are really specific to uh, the UK Diptera. And um, both Mara and Lindell have made reference to that already. So there are some, some issues there. Um, and then the last few slides are really just uh, me having a bit of fun looking in the literature um, at interesting papers or papers that I thought were interesting. Um, Mara has talked about this as well, um, of the, the uses that we can make um, of these, these genomes that we're generating. So it's, um, you know, the future is bright and it looks, there are lots of exciting things that we can do. Okay, so. So this is not by any means um, a, a summary of all the papers that have been published. Um, this is just um, a web of science search that I did. Um, my keywords were I searched for Diptera and whole genome, uh, and it gave me uh, 1,800 results. I mean, I, I think the absolute number isn't really that important. Um, my timeline here, I've, this is deliberate. I've started in 1990 because that was when the Human Genome Project was launched. I'm sure we can all remember that. It was a very exciting bit of science. Um, and the, the first draft of the Human Genome came out in 2000. Uh, and you can see that um, things have taken off since then um, and more and more papers are coming out. I don't think this is a, there's going to be any sort of one-to-one -one relationship between the number of genomes that are published and the number of papers that are published, because obviously what, is a, what makes for a minimum publishable unit um, will change over time. At the start, gene, you know, producing a genome was a very sexy piece of science, so each genome would have got its own paper, but these days um, just producing a genome is no longer notable, so you're not going to get a one-to-one -one relationship between um, producing a genome and publishing a paper. Uh, so this is really just to show, I suppose this is more to point out that how new this field is um, and how it's expanding. Um, and you know, there's a, a really high rate of change in this field, so things are changing all the time. So this, uh, Okay, so I think the eagle-eyed among you are going to be disrespecting my graphic uh, already. Um, there are a few problems with this. This was generated automatically for me by uh, the Web of Science, so I'm going to disown this graphic. Uh, uh, last time I checked, the UK was still busy leaving the EU. As far as I know, England has yet to leave the UK, so this separation here is an obvious uh, mistake. And we've got the same thing going on with China here, separated into two pieces. So um, the, the statistics were uh, the USA is producing about 50% of these papers, uh, and then the, U the UK is in at 19%, uh, and then it's China at about 13%, followed by places like France and Germany. So the UK is doing a good job. We're, we're producing a lot of research here. So this is um, a little graphic on, this is actual um, genomes that have been published. Now there's a whole bunch of acronyms up, up here. Um, don't worry too much about these. These basically, these are the really big databases that are holding, hosting sequence data. Um, and the big one is the International Nucleotide Sequence Database uh, Collaboration. Uh, and that is actually a, a group of three uh, different databases. We've got the ENA, which is the European offer, uh, NCBI, which is the American one, and then the DDBJ, which is a Japanese database. And these three databases, they all talk to each other on a very regular basis. So in practice, it shouldn't make a difference which one of these 
you search on, they should all be returning the same sequence information. So in my sequence, uh, my search was on the NCBI genome database. Um, they have a number of databases. Um, you know, the most famous one, of course, is GenBank. That's part of NCBI. But this one is Genome, um, and this is for published genomes. Uh, I searched for Diptra. Uh, I wasn't able to re restrict my search to the UK. So this is just all published Diptra genomes. Uh, my results, I had 282 whole genomes. 329 organelle genomes, so that's going to be something like the genome for the um, uh, mitochondria, that sort of thing. So it's a mitochondrial genome, it's not the whole um, genome for the organism. And these are coming from 170 different taxa. Um, and it's possibly worth pointing out that these are scaffolds. Um, and what do we mean when we say something's a scaffold? Well, we don't know precisely every single uh, base pair in the genome. There are gaps, but it has been put together and we've got long reads where we know all of the base pairs and then there'll be a gap and then we get another long read. So this is, this is called a scaffold. So it's not absolutely everything that's in the genome, but it's a lot of very useful information. So this table is just a summary of, you know, what are, where are these genomes coming from? Uh, and this is no surprise, we've got Drosophila at the top at 76, and this has been a, a genetic model um, organism for many, many years. So it's really no surprise that we've got lots of genomes for Drosophila. And then we've got uh, quite a high number for Culysis, obviously mosquitoes, and then on down through these other families. Um, so, you know, what's out there already doesn't really come as a surprise. Um, oh, I'm getting some noise interference, so um, can people check that they've got their microphones muted? Because uh, we can hear someone's background at the moment. Okay, excellent. So this is a search for DNA barcodes. So this is a, a different database. This is the bold database, and this reference here. Um, is really uh, the bold people setting out their stage for their grand scheme. They're going to, you know, they're going to asking us to generate uh, DNA barcode sequencing for, for life, for everything. Uh, so this came out in 2007. And the, really the major difference with the bold database is that they're trying to get everyone to sequence the same gene so that the sequences from all these different organisms are directly comparable. So the, the, the gene they chose was the cytochrome C oxidase subunit number one. So the vast majority of the information that's in the bold database is going to be for this single CO1 gene. Uh, now, Mara has already touched on the, the problems that are you know, inherent in trying to use a single gene for everything. Um, and you know, no surprise, this has turned out to not be possible. So uh, things like vascular plants, they have to use a different gene um, and fungi, they can't use the CO1 gene for those either. So there are more, uh, it is more than CO1 in the bulk database, but a lot of it, um, the metazoan is all CO1. So this was a search, they have much better metadata on bold. So I was able to restrict this to the UK. So all of the, all of this stuff um, that I've got out has come from specimens that were sampled in the UK. So I've got 2,300 published records, um, and it says that they're coming from 282 different species. So um, what are these species? Well, these, these are not the same uh, groups as the genome, the published genomes. We have got um, high numbers for mosquitoes, um, but then we've got simulates, um, uh, and they weren't in the other list at all, I don't think. Um, so uh, the beagle-eyed among you will see that um, apparently Bold has found um, some extra taxa in the UK for us, which is, you know, what well, top result. Um, this is obviously not true. Um, people have put things into Bold, um, you know, as a, um, for example, in the simulates, it says we've only got one species to go and we're at 97%. Um, there's actually stuff in there um, there are species complexes in there where you have to look at 
chromosomes to uh, distinguish the, the very close sibling species. And so there are things in there that are um, a particular species, uh, sensu latu or sensu strictu or near this species. And all of those will be returned as different taxa. So the numbers are inflated here and we haven't actually um, got complete coverage or near complete coverage for, uh, for these things yet. Uh, and it's, it certainly hasn't found uh, cryptic species that we didn't know we had in the UK. Okay. Right, so um, I think I'm rapidly running out of time actually. Yes, okay, so this was a very useful publication uh, that has only just come out. This is October um, 2020, uh, and this is from some colleagues um, at the museum. Um, and they, they're using the UK Species Index list. Um, so they're saying that there are 76,000 species in the UK. Um, and uh, interesting things like um, possibly as much as 5% of the, the UK biota is, um, could be classed as endangered. Um, so it's going to be difficult for us to um, sample these things. So that brings me on to my next slide. So what are the challenges that are specific to uh, the UK Diptera? Um, so this uh, is, Mara mentioned this and Lindell also mentioned this, um, that we need, um, your insect needs to be a decent size if we're going to get a genome out of it. So uh, in this red box here, I've got a little uh, figure. This is taken from, uh, the um, introduction to families of British diptera that Stuart Ball put together for the Dipteris Forum. My copy of it is from 2008. Um, and there he's classified the families according to how large they are. Now, uh, this is worst case scenario, okay? So this, this is, these numbers are inflated um, because I've just entered uh, the smallest uh, representatives from a particular family. Um, so this is the bottom end. Uh, of these families. So they go all the way down to less than two millimeters. Uh, so we've got 17 families that have representatives at less than two millimeters. Um, and this is over 3,860 species. Um, so it could be as much as half of the UK diptera that we won't be able to sample because they're, they're just too small. Um, now up here, this is my timeline, I've got a timeline in here. Um, because I feel that this issue of size is actually the least of our problems and that by the end of the Darwin Tree of Life project, um, this stuff will be solved because the technology is moving so fast and Lindor and um, Mara have said this themselves, it's just changing so rapidly that we can do more and more with less and less. So I don't, I don't see this as a big issue, um, a big barrier to the project. I think we will, this will be overcome. Um, you know, 1990, start of the human genome, um, finished in 2000. So that's a decade to do one genome. Um, and the, the estimated cost was £3.8 billion. Um, so provided my maths is correct, that's £613,000 per megabase. Uh, jump forward to 2018, and this is the, Sa the Sanger Institute. Uh, doing the UK Biobank Vanguard project. Uh, and this was a pilot project uh, and they sequenced 50,000 human genomes at a cost of 30 million. So this is nine pence per megabase. So in two decades, we've seen this vast reduction in the cost of doing a genome. Uh, and the 2019 follow-on project from the Vanguard is to bump this number up to half a million human genomes. And the funding for this is 200 million pounds. And so we've, we've changed again. This, we're now down to seven pence per megabase. And this is just a little graphic from the Sanger Institute. Um, and this is, this is the rate that they're getting through uh, information. And you can see that this is increasing exponentially. So 2016, they were churning through 1.9 petabases. Uh, what's a petabase? Well, that's 10 to the power of 15. So we've got 15 zeros here, and it's shot up in the space of four years from 1.9 to 17.8. So 
no, this this technology is just moving so fast. I don't see this being a big problem. Uh, okay, so what does the UK fauna look like? This is just a graphic of all the families. We've got 109 families, 6,669 species. Um, so we're approximately 9% of the British biota. So that's a, a, a neat number. Um, and as Mara pointed out, we have got these mega diverse uh, families here at this top end. And these are all small nematocera that are difficult to identify. So this, this end of it is going to be an issue. Uh, so how easy are they to identify? So that's back to this problem here. So at the top, we've got fiendishly difficult, uh, going down to easy here. And uh, again, this is worst case scenario. So this is the top end number for each of these families. Obviously, some individual um, species in this family will be easy, but some of them are fiendishly difficult. And we've got three families in here. This is including um, the Cecidomyids, which is the most diverse family in the UK. So uh, according to this, um, there's a higher proportion of the UK um, fauna that we're not going to be able to identify. So, um, so this is probably going to be our big problem. Um, and I think that, uh, as Mara pointed out, um, I think that the DNA is going to come to our rescue here. Because if we can sort out um, effective barcodes um, that can identify these things uh, using small amounts of tissue, then there is a possibility that we can get um, a barcode for an unidentified fly, um, run that barcode in real time, establish that it's a fly that we want, um, and then the rest of the fly, or you know, we've just we've used some sort of lysis buffer to get the um, DNA for the barcode out of the fly without destroying it. Um, and that fly can then go forward um, potentially for a genome uh, in the future. So there are, way, there are ways around this um, identification impediment. And with that, I think my time is up and I had better stop talking. So. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, Zoe. Um, so we've got some questions coming in. Um, I'd quite quite like to start off by saying, presumably um, when we have all this data, there's going to be quite a lot of revision to the checklist. There'll be species splits that we don't know about. Is there any kind of system to think about how that might be put into process? I, I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask that question, but um, given the amount of data that um, these DNA people are getting through, they are, you know, they are whizzes at sorting out, um, you know, databases, managing your information. So I think they'll be able to support us with um, running our UK checklist in a more sort of um, effective way. Um, we just need to ask the right people um, and the right questions. You know, how are we going to manage this, um, this information? Um, so that it's it's up to date um, and usable. Um, so Nigel actually asked a question earlier, which was related, I think, to what you were were hinting, is that um, there are a lot of species that can only be identified using quite difficult characters under the microscope. So can you foresee a situation where people can actually just maybe remove a leg and have that barcoded and and that could help in the identification process. Do you think that's something we could see very quickly? I don't. I I don't know how soon it's going to happen. But I'm. I'm. Put, I'm this stuff is moving so fast, and they are doing so much more with with less and less DNA. But I think that this this is this is the way it's going to go. Um, and I think we should be optimistic. I I do think that they will be able to do this stuff. Um, I did go on one of the, the bio blitzes um, when we were able to go out and you know be close to people and so on. I went to Ainsdale um, and they took the little mobile lab with them and they had sequences there and they were sequencing things in real time. Um, so they were actually producing um, you know the sequence data um, on the spot while we were watching them, looking over their shoulder literally. So I think it is entirely feasible that. Um, once they've sorted out um, how to get, you know, long reads. Because at, at the moment, as, as Mara pointed out, um, the problem with getting genomes um, from very small um, 
flies is that there is there's not enough tissue um, and they they need the DNA to be um, very long pieces of DNA. So we have to do this flash freezing and so on. But they, you know, the, the team at Sanger are there, they're working on this and they're trying, they're going to try and sort this out for us so that we won't need such long reads of DNA to get a genome, and also that we won't need so much tissue um, to be able to get a DNA genome. And also there's the, the Bioscan project that Mara mentioned that um, is going to try and come up with better, because there is a problem with barcodes and this, this uh, fixation on CO1. It just doesn't work um, in some instances. And Mara gave the example of mosquitoes. So hopefully this Bioscan project is going to come up with a, a better suite um, of more genes that is going to really enable us to, to identify everything um, effectively. Um, and once we've set that up, then yes, we can, you know, we can use some sort of lysis buffer to wash a bit of DNA out of the whole fly. Um, that DNA can go quickly onto the little on-scene sequencer. Um, it tells us what the barcode is. And then we know whether we, we are interested in that fly or not, whether we've already got the information or whether we need the information. Um, and maybe we've got multiple individuals yeah, uh, of the same um, species and they're all lined up. And so, you know, different individuals, if we've barcoded them all with our lysis buffer, um, we can choose the one to go for a genome, uh, one to go to the expert taxonomist to be identified and so on. So it, it, I think it will be possible. And I, you know, we can do this. This will happen. <laughs> it's how I feel about it. <laughs> okay, so I think on that very optimistic note, we'll 